ओके हाय गाइस टुडे वी आर वेरी मच फॉर्चुनेट बिकॉज वी डू गॉट अ चांस टू टॉक विथ गोविंद गोविंद गर्ग he has a 7 years of experience or i think more than that in product development and management as well as a graduate from georgia state university recently he has done a successful exit from a uh, sis arc informatics private limited one of a company who is developing a product and more we can definitely know about that from george but the cool part is we found him like he is still now majorly in web2 world or a world where you know we are more centralized or something like that but now we are exploring web3 a totally new world with him coin mogul is one of the new startup where he is exploring new opportunities and coming up with excited thing so definitely in this podcast you will g- going to know more about how is the perspective of someone who want to start a new thing in web3 or in a total different industry from where he has done in the past how he is totally transforming what way what efforts and what pipeline we have to do with all this i would like to welcome govin hi how are you doing doing very well thank you for having me today that's really good so we start with you know first the excited part only the excited thing is what you are doing currently people are you know you are, you you also might be more energetic on the same how is thing moving on so coin mogul like definitely a different set of name or scenario like how you come to that name because name it, itself is a bit interesting in this case. absolutely so there are many applications that are currently being built in the web3 space and i think the word coin is kind of commonly used there so i think not thinking too much i thought that might be appropriate for my name but outside of that many let's say gambling or betting applications and many let's say play to earn applications on the web3 space they try to give their users something to aspire to and so similar applications like dream 11 right it's a, it's a dream or draft kings in the usa it it kind of gives an impression that if you take part then you'll turn into a king right and so similarly i wanted to give my users that kind of imagination that kind of let's say vision that if they come to my platform then they can become a mogul of something and so between coin and moguls i thought it was appropriate to combine the two and make this name so mogul is like a king in that exactly. thing like exactly. a, a king setup when we have like the uh, in india when there was the emperors who were known as the moguls sure. that same scenario is correct so only difference is mughal is the kings in from the delhi sultanate all of that but mogul is a british word stolen from mughal that means kind of a big person or something like that really? so the origination is from the indian word Britishers are learning too much from us. Yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That we can do it. Yeah. So, definitely as the name. So, from your name, I can definitely get to the point like here also as you, you know, uh, represent it, play to earn or some type of condition. So, definitely this thing might be, you know, the same here. But still, can you give a, a bit brief about how the business overall setup or how the users are going to interact and do everything? in your applications when it's come alive absolutely so whether in traditional means or not betting applications have been around for a long time right so in a traditional sense you go to a bookie that bookie also works with other people right so other people who want to bet and so that bookie will give you odds let's say you want to bet on sachin in a india versus pakistan match they'll tell you that sachin has a 1 to 5 chance in scoring x and so you bet on that chance and so this bookie takes the same bet and opposite sides from other people too right. so he creates a market from all of these bets so that is a non technical non even web application right but once you come to the web there are many betting websites that are available for people in any given country they can go in the website themselves or the market maker or the booker bookie and and it's the same thing but done in a kind of web 2 But in the last five years, there's been a separate kind of betting or gambling kind of uh, industry called daily fantasy sports. Right. Right. So what daily fantasy sports is, it tries to eliminate the odds-based stuff. 
It tries to increase the number of winners and it tries to reduce the risk for the actual better, okay. or the user. And so in, in any kind of daily fantasy, there's always a budget constraint. There is always uh, a salary associated with each player. And so you have to build a team under a certain budget constraint and compete with that team against other players. So it's significantly more skill-based than betting and traditional kind of betting applications. And so the issue with daily fantasy and all other betting applications is that it is kind of stuck to a single area in the world. DraftKings is only available in America. Dream 11 is only available in India. Geographical restrictions. Right? Exactly, exactly. And so in every other country, they have their own geographical provider. However, there's no world market created for this. And, and that issue is not necessarily to do with any country's laws. It has to do with money movement issues. Right. And so I thought this particular application may help in solving many of those issues. So that's why you choose on crypto over fiat. Exactly. Absolutely. So again, yeah. with, with fiat currency, the central banks control how much money comes in or goes out of the country. But with crypto, anyone can transact in any, tra any kind of currency using a stable coin or any other coin. And they can transact with anyone in the world. And exactly. so, yes. Yeah. And one interesting thing like these uh, fantasies games have what they bought it is like they added a skill so as they added a skill they are now not a complete betting app like you are not just guessing you are choosing and those players are playing so it is almost like you know you have created a gray area where you are not a betting but you can still a betting type of exactly concept. exactly very much so in that way uh, and like as we move on, so as you are on Web3 or something like that, so you surely would be launching it first on any specific network and then moving on any other. So which one you chosen and why for specific of that? Yeah, so when choosing networks, I we obviously, like many other founders, reviewed the kind of good parts of various different existing networks, including Ethereum, Cardano, uh, and, and many others for that matter. But at the end of the day, what mattered to me most was how many developers are in the ecosystem, how many users are using that ecosystem, and how expensive is it for me to transact with that ecosystem. And I think with all of those criteria for me, something that makes most sense for me is Solana. So Solana, the throughput is extremely high. Uh, it is still kind of, I can run applications directly on the L1 of the blockchain, layer one of the blockchain. Right. And it won't be an extreme cost. And so unlike Ethereum, where I'm running on third-party applications that are running on top of Ethereum, Solana I can run directly on the protocol itself. And so all of those factors really push me towards Solana. So yeah, we're going to build on, on Solana. On Solana. Yeah. That is really great. And now, you know, we know about, you know, uh, what is your application, how it's going to do or something like that. But many of our listeners who are, you know, having some ideas or something to build around, you know, many people have ideas. but one thing which really give them a you know a good back or you know they need a push is marketing yeah. so what are your strategies in current down trade period like where everything is going down so how you are planning to micro you know my market or how you are planning to reach the right people absolutely so i think initially my focus is going to be on early adopters right and in this case this uh, daily fantasy sports application is not for traditional sports. It's specifically for esports. Right. Right. And so with esports, there is a very enthusiastic community of people who either game or watch a lot of esports tournaments. And on the other end, with crypto, there's a lot of people who are what I would call crypto bros who know crypto very well, know all the dApps, know all the coins. Right. And the intersection of the two is where I'm interested, at least in my early adoption phase. I'm looking after release, we're, we're planning on releasing in, in sometime in February. Right. But after release, my initial mass of users is going to be targeted toward the, let's say, the Venn diagram intersection of esports lovers and crypto lovers, right? And it might be a small intersection, but what I'm going to get out of that is I'll be able to test many assumptions that I had about the product, change what I had about the product before I even get to a beta stage and release it for a larger market. So why I'm also releasing to this market is that the knowledge is there. I don't have to do any extra education on how to use wallets, which coins to use. And at the other end, 
they know what the esports is, they know how to play that esport, and so they'll know basically what they're doing when they get into the application. So I'm testing the kind of various functionalities around the main functionalities in the application with them. But after the initial, let's say, early adopter phase, I would definitely move on to more traditional marketing means, buying ad space on social media, uh, Google Analytics, the, but it'll be more toward targeting ads because these type of applications are very kind of advertisement heavy for me to bring in that inorganic user. Inorganic user. Absolutely. But there is one situation what I want to give you, like I totally understand like it is a very good phase we go for the early adopters, we do it out and we get a good success in that. Now, but there are two type of audience when you go for a social media marketing or something like that. One who is aware what is crypto and what thing is there and one who is not aware what is crypto. But without more audience, making the momentum or getting the uptrend is not possible. Absolutely. So we need those people who don't know what is crypto or who don't know, but they should come on board into this. Absolutely. We have to maybe like educate them or something like that. So are you going to put some extra effort or do you have, do you have something maybe out of like in the future? Are you, if some, some situation come in front of you, so what one or two direct strategy you think to bring those people on board who are not crypto savvy till now? Sure. Uh, so whenever I use any products, um, at least web applications, some things that I definitely enjoy is when the developer goes above and beyond in terms of giving help menus, in terms of giving outside of the application documentation, whether that's on YouTube or whether that's a blog on their website. Those things really help, right? Whether it's one user that's going to read it or multiple users that's going to read it, at some point there needs to be some kind of, whether it's documentation, but at least help, basically help stuff that helps users to kind of make the better decision. And so 100%, the, the, the key here is education of an uneducated populace. In this case, it's people who might be interested in betting but don't know enough about crypto or esports to get into my application. Right? right. And so for people like that, the education has to be two ways, right? I can educate them about stable coins. I can educate them about how to connect a wallet. I can educate them about anonymity that they get on the blockchain. So I can educate them about best uses of how to use a wallet, how to how that wallet interacts with the application. Outside of that, yes, there will be application related help in terms of the in-product related help. But more so out of all of that, that doesn't really attract new users, that doesn't really attract new user base. There has to be a real push um, from our end. I don't think that we've gotten there just yet um, to fully understand what exactly we're going to do. But 100% there will be uh, a much more larger push at that point. Yeah. yeah, but in this particular set of uh, reply, what I got like education is a key word which need to be done. So we do need to educate them. Maybe we need to, you know, give some videos, seminars, X, Y, Z, but definitely give them a comfortability. Like crypto is not something just uh, uh, scams. It is something real is happening and you can also take part. Absolutely. Absolutely. So coming to the next segment of any new startup the next segment like we discuss about the idea you get an idea you we, we thought about it you get a marketing strategy early adopter we got but the technology which is again one key part of it so how you are planning to keep what thing you are planning to keep in-house what thing you are planning to keep outsource and how you want to merge and manage that thing? absolutely um so in terms of technology and, and development initially i am a quasi let's say techno functional person I'm not a coder, I'm not a pure functional person too. I have a, a good bit of experience in product development. I have a good bit of experience in finance. And so I know my strengths. I know where I need to find a co-founder. I know where I need to go outsource to a third party service. And so in my view, um, the core functionality like operations, finance, and let's say marketing will all be in-house. Uh, more, let's say, commoditized uh, things like development, um, kind of web hosting, all the more technical side outside of let's say a CTO or architecture level will also be outsourced until the company grows large enough to bring it in-house. And so in terms of being a startup, kind of I'm wearing many hats at once, but I also kind of know 
where I don't have the expertise. And in that sense, I do use a lot of freelancing platforms similar to Upwork and, and so on to kind of fill the skills where I don't necessarily have just yet. And so it's, it's definitely playing a, a tightrope walk on where I want to go outsource and where I don't. But for the most part, the core business functionalities will be in-house and the more tech functionalities will be kind of outsourced. Yeah, and that actually makes sense because, you know, there is a saying which I really remember, like I, I, I was just going through some books and, and recently I, I, I just heard or some, read something you can say, like if you are a best plumber, that doesn't mean you can run a good plumbing business. Absolutely. To run a plumbing business, you don't need to be a plumber. That is the key part here. So to run a tech thing or this this type of ideas, you don't need to be a tech guy who can develop a do it up the thing. And we should also not be worried about sharing this thing with others because Absolutely. this is your vision. This is your child and no one can take care about your child better than you. So you don't need to worry about that. The people who adopt, they just take care like that only. You know, they that's are not one of the founder's worst fear is if I even tell one person, will they run away with the idea? <laughs> no, no one has time. No one cares as much as you care. Yeah. So tell everyone. Yeah. Tell everyone. So, <laughs> yeah. so as you mentioned about, you know, the Upwork and these all platforms. And so I'm assured like you might have went through their process and everything on that. So any feedback, any, any, you know, any problems or anything you found in their process, which you think they should or, you know, which something need to be modified on it? Absolutely. So I think, first of all, Upwork is phenomenal. The work they're doing helps a lot of people like me and a lot of freelancers themselves find work that they couldn't find otherwise. So hats off, they created a market, they created a marketplace of talent that's available to basically anyone in the world. But outside of that, where I think that they have room for improvement is once I've worked with someone for so long and I've established some kind of comfort with them, the kind of, if I want to hire them full time or if I want to bring them on as a co-founder, they put a lot of red tape there, right? Okay. Right. And so, for example, I think one time I tried to hire my lawyer full time. I went through that entire Upwork process. And so what they do is they try to calculate their earnings throughout the rest of their life oh. on Upwork. And so my lawyer, who I pay $50 an hour to, it would have cost me $220,000 to buy his contract from Upwork to hire him full time, which I think is an extremely broken process. So I think that is where a lot of people leave the Upwork platform, whether they're freelancers or clients. And I think that's something that if they fix, the business will only grow with them. So yeah, that's one okay, area. So, so, so this is something I I found like, you know, if they don't take 220K or something, yeah. but if they take some reasonable amount, then people will prefer to go through upper platform exactly. and they are happy with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. But they are charging so extreme. So people say, okay, no issue. Come on, WhatsApp. Let's talk separately. Exactly. Like nothing is going to happen, frankly, if you are doing it directly. Yeah. So in that way, that's, so that's a good point to come in like, like I, I hope Upwork listen this yeah, and they yeah, can yeah. modify it. That is our hope. Yeah. But the key part is like if you want to will, you know, if you are working long term and if you want to take a right path on it, then you should definitely have some good way to do it up. Absolutely. So that is something is there. Now, definitely your rest of the things are really good, but we do got some feedback from, you know, our other audiences or something about this outsourcing and they put up some questions. So, which I want to ask it up in that case. Sure. Like, key part, like past work verification, like pa when you keep some job post or something there and many people like say about I have done this or that or something like that. They have their past work. but. If someone verify and give you that or would you like to verify that past work or how much that past work verification is important for you? Very much. It's, it's extremely important. Um, Upwork has some mechanism to verify their past work, but it has to be past work that's been done on the platform. Right. Right. So not their any work that's done off the platform. Yeah, there's a space for it, but there's no way for them to verify it. I don't know if they verify degrees. I don't know if they verify anything. But at least the work that a freelancer has done on the platform, whether it's other clients doing a review for their work, giving a star rating and then writing the entire feedback, Upwork does a good job in kind of compiling that and presenting it to me. But there is a huge opportunity for them to kind of figure out a way to verify off 
chain work also exactly of upwork work because they are freelancer and freelancer means they are working with many people at any situation that case happens up and so they would have many more qualified candidates if they could do that because i would be more assured to hire a non top rated plus person like you and hire a person who has verified work history verified background all of those things definitely yeah. i understand like it is not necessary like he is top rated because that has a different situation like he is not that much focus on upwork and he is not doing thing sure. because top rated means you are 100% Focused on this exactly. you are giving millions of rupees to upwork so upwork is promoting it that is a direct That's business setup is, there yeah. is no alternative to that but if that is verified then that give you assurance like okay this is something is happening in that absolutely that totally makes sense another situation is here like you are actually hiring someone for something which you don't know like the skills you don't know at 100 percent you are not hiring your uh, you know uh, junior you are hiring a different tech sets which help you out so if there is a scenario where there is some neutral tech expert who do a analysis on that particular developers on their skill set and create a report or something like that will that scenario help you to make some decisions or can you rely on that thing at certain point i'm sure at the point when i was still evaluating tech help things like that would have definitely whether it changed my mind or at least helped me make my mind up faster 100% okay um but because that didn't exist i would have to go through various different other forms of information and try to put it together and then make a decision then so 100% it would help me yeah in the whole setup if you would have worked out in that way yeah agreed so with this we are just on the last question on this segment like how was your till now like any good or bad experience or something you want to share which you happened and how that if it is bad then how that would have done better by the developer because many time from the developer perspective you know if something bad happen people want to run away yeah. or you know they just think like let's forget everything and the new journey will start but there are a, still there is a area to you know make the collaboration or something like that so anything which you have experience and so so far in upwork i think i've had quite a positive experience um i've mostly hired top rated and top rated plus freelancers and so their work already kind of speaks for themselves but a couple of the freelancers i hired even within those categories um definitely had some quirks where i have to explain work more than once twice three times over that's definitely frustrating for me as a client um which i wasn't able to tell initially from their job history job profile and everything but outside of that i think upwork does a great job in screening candidates I don't particularly have any negative stories with candidates yet. I'm sure in the future as I use the platform more and more of those will come out. But I think uh for the most part the way I've been screening freelancers um fingers crossed I haven't come up with anything bad yet. Yeah. That is good. And yeah. actually many time from my also experience with I I want to say it is not like people are bad, it is just the timing is not right. But if you don't communicate the right thing maybe you become bad it Absolutely. is not always you have done the wrong thing or you want to scam or something like that but and you don't find scammers here but definitely you have a, to have a proper communication set to work it out on it absolutely working on it so moving with this now we are in the next segment now here everyone will you know a success story right now in this world is something which like for example there is a very well said like if you are planning to go to moon you should plan two thing go and come back then only it is a success if you only go and then you can't come back that is it so right now if you are planning to do any startup or something like that you should have a plan like after 5 or 10 years or where you wherever you want to achieve who is going to buy you how you can sell you out so that you can you know try something new and you already went through this journey with your current your or your past company i sense sure. say like so how was your overall this experience of quitting successfully like how this goes Absolutely. and how it work out so when i joined sysorg informatics um it's my father's firm uh, so it's a family company and so when i joined the expectation itself was that i use my financial skills and everything that i learned in the past to help position the company to sell to a investor uh that itself took quite a few years initially we had tried uh sysarks um traditional products their legacy products are not cloud enabled it was a very difficult sell to any venture capital 
And so we had to basically change the company's products, invent new products, create revenue out of that products, so we could attract the right investors and sell the company. And so my goal going into Sysart was always to exit. Uh, it wasn't to kind of take this company to a different level. In a certain sense, that had to be done for us to have a successful exit. But the goal at any time was to find the right investor so we could have a successful exit. My father and family can retire and do their own thing. And so with that idea in mind, I think I took off more of my finance side and became more of a product development, product management expert. And so, yes, that exit was in mind during that time, but more was how do I build this company's product portfolio so that investors that will come in a few years' time will like what they see and buy it. And I think that was quite successful. We finished the exit um, about three days ago, four days ago. And so I think that long-term vision has come to reality now. So this is really a good thing. You know, frankly, many people say my goal is to make million, my goal is to make billion, but no one say my goal is to get exit. Yeah. Okay, so this is a very good thing which you have kept in mind. And as you mentioned, like, once you make a plan of exit, it takes time. Like, it has taken some, some years to you Absolutely. also to make the whole setup or something like that. But again, you know, one key question comes up here, like, who was your investor? When, when you really thought about, like, doing the exit or getting it done in that way, who was the real investor was there in your mind? Like how you finalize who is going to be? Is it going to be your competitor or sure. your that thing? Who is going to be that? So in any kind of acquisition, um, the highest bidder is going to be a strategic buyer. And that's most likely going to be direct competition. And so initially, we wanted to court the competition. We wanted to make sure that they knew that we were for sale. But at the same time there, if we tell them, then they'll go tell the market and that'll also create bad news for us. Right. And so if a, if a competitor came to us through one of our M&A advisors, then we would entertain a request. But outside of that, we were looking for the most strategic buyer that has a reason to enter the market that doesn't just buy some random company for the cash flows. And so eventually that's what we found. We found a company that was looking to enter into the India market that was looking for an established software company with n number of people running for n number of years with good clientele and with recurring revenue more than anything. And so we structured our business such a, in such a way to be attractive to more than one type of potential investor. It took time, but, but uh, it was. So it here worked. you, your potential were one was the competitors. If they want to bid higher, they can get it done so that they can enhance their portfolio and Absolutely. make a good you know market or uh, grab the market second someone who is there in this particular thing or interested in this particular thing but in different domain or different area or different geography and want to come into it absolutely so this is something can be done so this is a key thing which we can understand or learn like you know when we need to plan exit before planning we have to keep in mind who is going to buy it? We have their image, their set, and definitely make a surrounding to that, and that's going to be done. So with this, now we are at one more next segment. This is a bit different type of it. It is just yes and no. <laughs> and with the yes and no, you definitely have some reasons which you can share it out and work it out. Sure. So first, because we, you know, I know you have brought up in US and you know, you have that culture, something like that, but still, India is there some part in your blood and DNA. So these questions come, that's why for you, like, did you always reach the meeting on time? Uh, no, I'm Indian after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, like, why, like, I, I don't say, like, I am the person who is always late or I am the person who is always on time. Yeah. But sometimes I'm But, but it is in the mindset, like, if someone say the meeting is as two, then we think like everything need to start at 2. Yeah. Like we don't think everything to need to start at 150. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like Very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you see any type of big loss or something in your decision or in your business because you were in the decision maker team? Sure. So more than financial loss, I saw a kind of attrition at our company based on decisions that I had made. Um, kind of looking back at it, it was much more of a learning experience. I wouldn't say I just thought it was a random mistake and never make it again. It's more of a, what did I do wrong? How do I avoid that in the future? 
what can I do to correct this past mistake? And so, 100 percent, yeah. But, you know, we learn from the mistakes. It is good to do mistake. If we don't do, we never learn. Very true. I, I frankly, just, just a small incident in, you know, I was playing uh, like a normal, you know, a card bet, a three bet, teen patti bet or something sure. we generally play. There is a trick like how you bluff. To learn the bluff, I have I have paid 500 rupees. <laughs> I got bluffed and then I remember, bluff. okay, this way people bluff. <laughs> so Very you need to pay to learn that, that, that happened in that. Now, now is the time like people, you know, companies are calling back their employees to work from office and you know, they were, that is happening. So what do you think like work from home and work from office? It's a debate type of thing. So which one is profitable or how? Things go I think up. they both have their pluses and minuses and I think a hybrid work culture is, is going to work much better for companies in terms of attraction of employees, <clears throat> reducing their regular costs. Um, I'm a fan of seeing employees maybe or my colleagues once a week, once a month, but at least having some kind of face time, whether that's at dinner or whether that's a few hours at work. But I definitely prefer sitting at my desk and working because well, there's, well. there's no one bothering me. I can do what I want finish eight hours of work in two hours, that can only be done at home, not at the office. Done at home? Yeah. I thought you were going to say done at office. Okay. <laughs> so you are the person who like working from home with full focus and no Absolutely. one disturbing you. Yeah. But you are fortunate like at home, no one is disturbing you. When I work from home, many people come with their personal request to do I'm it. Sure, up. I'm sure. So that is it a It really thing. depends on your situation. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that is the thing. And as you mentioned, like, and this also, like, this also I experienced or something like that, you know, when we keep someone like to come once a week or something like that, then it come and it's a, it's a friendly time. Like we, when he's there once a week, it is something like, okay, the friend came or they came, let's meet, talk. There is less work, yeah. but definitely if you have a full focus on work from home, then it is a good productive thing. You save time in traveling. You don't Absolutely. need to, you know, give answers to many people all around. You have to just complete your task and do it up. So there are some positive points on it. So now as our last question in this particular setup is there, betting. Sure. There, because your whole, you know, coin Mughal is also going on the betting side or something. So can you like, can you imagine or do you think like betting can be like, you know, a real, like doing a betting can be a a professional career for someone for a long term? Like bet, 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 bet and win, win, win. Yeah, so I think some people have made a professional career out of it, but statistics and past history shows that betting cannot create long-term value. It is purely entertainment purpose. Uh, even in the stock market, only the top 5% of the participants ever beat the market, right? So you're most likely never going to beat the market, whether you go into a more safer play like the stock market or whether you kind of gamble. You might win once, you might lose once, or you might keep losing, or you might win a few times. It, there's, there's no kind of, uh, it, it's, it's very much a luck thing. But with daily fantasy, it's a combination of luck and a little bit of skill, right? The skill being your ability to do data analysis on the player's past performance, project that analysis on the current scenario, how is the player going to perform today, and compare that against the other players, right? So it's creating a little bit of skill where there used to be only luck. However, it is still an entertainment game only. There is very little likelihood that anyone will build long-term wealth out of this platform. And so, yeah. Yeah. But that is true. Like, as you added a fact, like, you know, it is adding some skill. So definitely it is giving them some chance to take the decision, not totally on luck, but they can do certain analysis and get some positive, like, less chances of losing Absolutely. like it has a less margin of losing or something like that so with this we are almost at the end of our session and it was really inspiring and learning because the key part which i think our listeners should take today is definitely to start you have to do marketing you have to team management dream everything is there but if you keep a target like whatever you are building how you get an exit and if you make a proper plan at how to make an exit and do it out you can be successful may not be in the journey but at the end you see like there are many companies who are in losses but has very high valuation that is because they are doing something for the right type of investors and those investors are adding money in it Absolutely. so there is a scope in doing it that so with this we are just like to share like we just like to hear some 
last few words on your inspiration and motivation which is keep you learning or keep you burning all your days and you know you are moving it up so do share with our listener on that yeah definitely I, i would say before i went into a kind of a entrepreneurial journey i always thought that i need to know everything before i even begin to start my own business but one kind of book that i read is something called the lean startup and what they present in that is that a startup is like a good experiment right you craft a bunch of hypotheses you test against that hypothesis make the changes you want and you keep iterating on that cycle and eventually you'll come to a product that works whether you are an expert or not if you follow the scientific process if you test your hypotheses and you move forward in that direction diligently at some point you will come up with a product that builds value for someone or some group of people and i think those basically that process that was kind of explained to me through that book and what i've kind of researched after that is what i see as my own guiding light when i'm building my own product or kind of advising others on how to proceed is don't start big don't let the scope creep start small start with small assumptions focus on a one small part when you're building out a kind of minimum viable product so you don't have to test as many things you don't have to confuse yourself with things that you could have built or could not have built right so so my view is treat a startup like a scientific experiment test against that startup by creating the hypotheses and iterate and you will find success down the line definitely and this advice is very good when if you know there are many people who are having their full time job or work or they think like if i have to do a startup i have to make like for example if i have to do a startup against flipkart or e-commerce i have to give every functionality but that is not necessary so as gorab said like you know we have to work on this some specific thing make it small test it and work out on it so with all this thing i definitely like to thank because of your all the ideas which you shared all the vision you have given the listeners will really understand the key part of it and you know work around on the whole setup with this i would like to thank you all i will provide you all the you know for the listeners i will provide you the connecting point to go in with all the linkedin and that all thing that will be in the description and you guys can just check it out do check coin mogul in web3 do connect do test it out and provide your feedback and if possible be the early adopter 